morning. I guess it's time for us to begin. We're going to be uh, talking about the transfiguration this morning. The trans what? The transfiguration of Jesus uh, on a high mount in Jerusalem. But before we get there, let's go to God in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for life continued. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us, uh, not only this past week, but through our entire lives. And Father, we're so grateful for those things. Father, we're grateful that you provided us a plan of salvation that we can follow, that we can understand. And Father, we pray that uh, we'll make the ready applications through our studies that will apply those things to our hearts and minds that we learn, that we can learn to be better uh, better sons and daughters of God, and that we can be examples to everybody about us. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Before we get to the transfiguration, uh, that would be uh, talking about, I think that's on uh, page 528 through 533 in your book. But before we get there, I want to cover some of the past questions from the previous uh, study, which is 528 through 533, and uh, the question is, could there have been a church without the death of Christ? Could there have been a church without the death of Christ? Remember Matthew chapter 16, he says, I will build my church. And so the church had yet to be established when Jesus said that because he said, I will build my church. So there was some time in the future, and we learn uh, later that it was Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 uh, about uh, 50 days after after the Passover and uh, and so we find here that, uh, that Jesus had built his church but would it have been possible uh, had he not died That wasn't a plan, exactly right. Uh, he said that in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, that he purchased the church with his own blood. There would not have been any purchasing uh, without the death of Christ with his own blood. And I find it interesting that in, uh, in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 1, he said, God who, in various, uh, God who in various times and in various ways in time past, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, whom, uh, by whom he created the world. So then he goes on to say that he himself purged our sins. He himself. Now, you look at creation, and we can find that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, work together, that each had a different role in the creation, the father planned evidently, but worked creation through his son, and Jesus worked his creation through the spirit. So all three were working together uh, in creation. All three worked together in providing us God's word. The father gave Jesus the words, and then after his death, uh, he told, or before his death, he told his apostles that I'm going to send you another comforter, and he will guide you into all truth, talking about the Holy Spirit. And then he said, he will take from mine, take from what is mine, and give to you. So in other words, he will take my words, and, uh, and then he will give them to you, for he cannot speak on his own accord. So the Father gives Jesus the words, Jesus when he ascended back to heaven, gave the Holy Spirit words so that he could give the words to the apostles when they preached and when they wrote scripture. So uh, that was the whole process of agency where one steps in and does the work for another. So we can say God provided scripture. God who? Well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit provided scripture. And... Uh, and the same thing with creation. It says God created, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, who's God? Remember the, the, the Hebrew word for God 
is Elohim, and that's a plural word. So it could say gods, but it, it doesn't mean that uh, in the Hebrew. But there's a plurality there. Now, the, 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 the word for God in a singular nature is El. E-L. And then in the plural, it's El Ohim. So they add on O-H-I-M to make it plural. So what you have is God is one, but there's a plurality. There's a plurality. And so we learn as you read the rest of your Bible that that plurality consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are God. All three uh, possess one divine nature. And so all three are eternal. All three, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing that one can do that the other two don't know. Because they're all knowing, right? If you're all knowing, you know everything. You know what's going on even before it, it happens. And that's what the Bible says about God. He says, we know, or he knows what we need even before we ask, right? So he knows the future, he knows the past. And so, uh, with that said, God is comprised of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And here, uh, Jesus, it says, he, by himself, purged our sins. So, with no help of the Father... With no interference of the Father, with no help of the Spirit, with no interference of the Spirit, he himself did that. So that was his sole responsibility for you and me, and that he was to purge our sins, and then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I find that uh, an incredible thing to think about when you think about the, how they work together in unison, and yet in this one divine purpose... The death, of the, on, the death of Christ on the cross, he did all of that himself, by himself, his own blood. And so that when we go back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says he purchased the church with his own blood, not the Father's, not the Spirit's, his own blood, his own blood. And, uh, and so uh, without the death of Christ, there would not be a church. Because it had to come by and through his blood. And there wouldn't be any forgiveness of sins, right? There wouldn't be any forgiveness of sins had it not been that specific individual, Jesus Christ, who purged our sins by his blood. The other thing to consider is that uh, Jesus, when he died, not only did he shed his own blood, he said, I will build my church, right? So the church is his role. The church is his role. So think about that for just a second. They, we always ask the question, what's in a name? And there's, uh, there's a hint of that in the bulletin today. If you, you can take, a, take and read one of the shorter articles. But uh, talk about the name of a church. The name of a church. And the question is this. If you can think of churches that have names, particular names assigned to it, and you can't find it in the Bible, is that church biblical? Right, it's, it's not, because God has assigned the name. God has assigned the description, not us. We can't come along and say, uh, Doug's church, right? And we're going to study about Jesus and all of that, but still Doug's church can't be Doug's church. There's one church that Jesus built, which we are members of. It's not mine, it's not yours, it's his. So to call it another name than the way God calls it would be to call it something else. That would be to say, well, God doesn't mind if I change it. God doesn't mind if I use another name. Because God is love. Well, God is love, but God also is a God of love that expects us to obey him and to do what he says. Remember, if you're going to speak, speak as, exactly as the word of God. Speak as the oracles of God. So if we're to speak as God speaks in his word, 
then we ought to be able to speak just as he has provided those words to us and for us and in no other way. The whole point of this is that we cannot deviate. We can't deviate based upon our own whims and think, you know, there's a sin called the sin of presumption. What's presumption? What does presumption mean? To presume something. Like, I presume that these two ladies are going to go out to dinner today. I may be right, I may be wrong. Right? I got a 50-50 chance. They either will or they won't. But, that the idea of presumption is, I'm speaking for them. Where they have not spoken, where I don't really know for sure. And to presume to act on God's behalf is to presume to act where God has not spoken. And as uh, Brother uh, Roy used in the example Wednesday night about Uzzah, remember the, the Ark of the Covenant was on the ox cart. And uh, that, the Ark of the Covenant was about this big. It wasn't all that, it wasn't all that big. Just a little box, really. A gold box that had a few things in there. And uh, and as the, the cart was going down, the ox, the ox are pulling the cart, and they hit bumpy ground, and the thing started to go like this, and the Ark of the Covenant began to rock back and forth, and it was about to tip off and roll off the cart. And this guy named Uzzah, he came running over. Woo! He comes running, and he holds up the cart, and he restations it and puts it back on the cart. Boom! He dies. What did he do? He presumed something. He, he presumed God needed help. <laughs> I'll settle. I'll, I, you know, we make, from the human standpoint, we look at that and we say, I would have done the same thing. You know, all of us would probably would have said, oh, it's fallen. I got to. But we have to keep in mind, God said, only the priests can touch that ark. And only those priests, no one else, he violated God's law. So the idea was they did something they presumed God might like. Or he presumed he, that God might like his action. Well, he didn't because he violated God's will. And so he deviated from what God said to do. Now we come into the New Testament. And Paul says... Paul says there have some who have perverted the gospel. Perverted means to twist. To twist. So some have twisted uh, the scriptures, as Peter says. Some have twisted the scriptures to their own destruction. So we need to be careful because these are God's words, not ours. And we are to uphold those words. We are to follow those words. We are to honor those words. So, we find here that Jesus, on the mount that he is transfigured upon, uh, and we'll get to that in just a second, but as we think about that mountain, which mountain was it? Do you remember? Because surely you got up this morning, and you took out your book, and you read pages 528 to 533, right? Just to get the freshness in your mind and perhaps answer the questions that might be asked of you. And you notice I really haven't asked any questions until now. But just like every teacher, I got a got a surprise quiz. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. There you go. You know why it's that? Because no one knows. No one knows what mountain. It doesn't say. So some say it was Mount Tabor. But that's 50 miles away from Caesarea Philippi, where they were. Where they were. Uh, the closest one is Mount Hermon, but it doesn't say. So why should I presume to speak for God? Why? I can't say. It was Mount Tabor. Now, a lot of people, there have been debates about this. People have actually debated this topic, whether it was Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. And... Uh, 
and, and, and if you didn't agree with them, boy, you're going to hell because they knew it was Mount Tabor. Really. Someone's going to stake their soul saying that if you don't believe that it's Mount Tabor, you're going to go to hell. Hmm. Remember, the Bible tells us don't add to God's word. Don't take away from God's word. So the idea of being able or willing to add to God's word is presuming that God would accept that. We'll talk about that in the sermon today. So, so he was on the Mount of Transfigured. What does transfigured mean? Transfiguration or transfigured. We hear that word trans a lot today change, right? To cross to cross over right? To cross over the Trans-Siberian it crosses over the Siberian region uh, we call it the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, but there's a Trans-Siberian Railroad or uh, train uh, but anyhow uh, the Trans-Atlantic you cross the Atlantic that's what that means so and you have uh, trans females and you have trans males today right well they claim to be but they cross over they cross they're claiming to cross over from uh, being a guy to a girl or being a girl to a guy so they're trans or trannies trannies as they say in the, the lingo but uh, transfiguration means to change it means to cross over and uh, we find what happened on that mountain was that uh, Jesus took two other disciples with him, or three other disciples with him. Do you remember who they were? Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. This, after we read this, you'll have your answer. Matthew chapter 17. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. So he, uh, you know, it's kind of like Moses. When Moses went up the mountain to be with God, to receive the Ten Commandments, when he came down the mountain, he was white. He was white. I mean, he was translucent white being in the presence of God. And actually, he wasn't in the real presence of God because God had veiled himself. So God worked a miracle so that Moses could be in his quote-unquote presence. And, uh, but yet, even that could not keep Moses from turning white. I mean, he just turned completely translucent. You could see through him a glow. That's what the idea is. And so this is what happened with Jesus. And he's up on the mountain. He transfigures. And the apostles are looking at him. And, uh, and let's go ahead and read the rest. And it says, And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, bright, white, like Moses. And his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So there's part of what we're reading about that took place. So we got uh, Peter, uh, Peter, James, and John. They're the three disciples that go up. They witness this event, and uh, as well as Peter. And they saw Jesus become uh, bright, light, and white. And, uh, and then we find here that Moses and Elijah appeared to them. Now, what's... What's significant about Moses and Elijah showing up here? And it says that they're talking with Jesus. They're dead. That's right. right. When did Moses die? Well, about 1,700 years before. 
and, uh, and Elijah not too much longer after that. So over a thousand years have passed by, and Elijah and Moses show up on the scene with Jesus. Now they recognize Jesus. They've been with Jesus for three years. And now Moses and Elijah showed up. How do you think they recognized Moses and Elijah? Because Peter said, oh, I'm going to make three tabernacles or three shelters. One for Moses, one for Elijah. Well, how did he know that that was Moses and Elijah? How do we know? He never saw Moses because Moses lived. 1,700 years prior to himself. So, and they didn't have paintings. They didn't have, uh, you know, uh, photography. They didn't have all that. How did he know what he looked like? How could he just respond to him and say, hey, Moses, how you doing? All right. There you go. There you go. You heard him talking. He, right. You heard him talking, baby. So if you go to, uh, oh, well, let's go to uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Mark 9, verse 2. So this is the third year now, the beginning of the third year of Christ's ministry, which means there's one more year till his death. On the cross. Now verse 2. Mark 9. Now after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John. And led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly. White like snow. Such as uh, no wanderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be. So you're right, you old. They heard him, he heard him talking. So evidently, they introduced themselves. They introduced themselves. You could read Luke's account. You'll probably get the same information there, and uh, you will. And, uh, and so you're not going to get any more than that. But we, we don't want to presume. But based upon the information we have... They were talking. Is it quite natural that you could overhear somebody, some of their conversations? Sure, they were there. Because Peter is listening. And that's why Peter jumps in to let them know what he wants to do. To build three tabernacles. So back to our text in Matthew chapter 17. So... So why did Peter want to make those three shelters? Three tabernacles. Because he was, he knew Moses after he, after he knew that it was Moses and he knew that it was Elijah. I mean, as you grow up as a kid, as a Jew, you learn that, hey, Moses, man, that Moses was, was the best prophet ever. I mean, he was, the, he was God's guy and he was a hero to the Jews. And so a lot of the a lot of the parents would name their Jewish kids Moses. Just like a lot of the parents name their kids Yeshua, Joshua, which in Greek and English would be Jesus or Jesus. So a lot of the they would name them after their heroes of the faith. And so he thinks Moses is worthy of a tabernacle. He thinks Elijah is worthy of a tabernacle. And certainly he thinks Jesus is worthy of a tabernacle. And I think I asked this question sometime before, but what was Peter actually doing there? And I think you answered that. Go ahead. He was putting Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. He was putting Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. And why not? You would think, you know, Moses is great, Elijah is great, Jesus is great. They're all three are great. Put them on the same level. Well, let's continue reading. In verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Don't listen.
listen to Moses any longer. Don't listen to Elijah any longer. The law is no longer applicable because my son, my beloved son, is bringing in a new covenant. Listen to him. He has the words of life, as Peter would say, right? Remember when Jesus asked the apostles after the, all these people were running away from Jesus and all the people were leaving and, and Jesus turned to Peter and to the rest of the apostles and he says, are you guys going to go too? And Peter turned around, where can we go for you? You have the words of life. Well, they knew that Jesus had the words of life. Not Moses, not Elijah, even back then. But now uh, the Jews, and these apostles certainly represent the Jews, are being told that Jesus is the man. You listen to Jesus. Go back to Ma uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18. So all the way back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 18. We'll start in verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, is giving you, notice the, the tense there, is giving, you, you're going to have this land, is what he's saying. What's he talking about? What land is he talking about? The promised land, right? The promised land. They're going to go into the land of Canaan, land flowing with milk and honey. And, uh, and so this is Moses writing. Remember, he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He wrote the, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, he's writing them down because God tells him to write this down. And so he writes, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. What does that mean? Yeah, the pagans uh, would sacrifice their kids to the god of Molech. And, uh, and the, the kid would, they'd make him walk through the fire. And he'd be consumed by the fire and die. And they'd all go, yeah. There's some sick people, right? Let their kids do that and see anyone die in that fashion. But that's what God, or that's what Moses was warning them about. He's already warning them that before he, before they went out, just after, just before the Mount Sinai, Moses told the people, here's what's going to happen. We're going to be saved. You're going to mess up. And then you're going to go into a land that God has chosen for you. You're going to take that land. But guess what? You're going to fall away. You're going to leave your God. Imagine that. And I wonder how many people said, no way. That ain't going to happen to me. I'm a, I'm a God-fearing man. I'd never do such a thing. What are you talking about, Moses? Well, they did. Well, through their sons, anyhow, and daughters, they began to marry, intermarry into the lands that were there. And why were they there? Because they didn't kick them out, right? God told them, you drive those people from Canaan. And they said, okay, but they didn't. And they let them stay and then over time, they began to intermarry, and they began worshiping their gods. And guess what? They began running their children through the fires, like Moloch, and to the god of Moloch. So, he says, uh, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. 
For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to the soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Now, it's interesting that Peter quotes this verse in Acts chapter 3 and certainly applies it to Jesus. And he said, this is what God the Father said in the long ago about his son Jesus, that he was going to be the prophet like Moses and you're going to hear him. Lo and behold, we're on this mount of transfiguration. A voice from the cloud above comes out and says, this is my beloved son, hear him. He's putting his stamp of approval right there on his son Jesus. Now where else was that expression found? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When he was baptized. So just before he begins his ministry, and now at the end of his ministry. Now at the end of his ministry. So he's, he, he go ahead. understand it. Messiah was going to be a conqueror. A conqueror. Your Messiah was going to lead your nation, be their king, and any nation that would rise up against you would be defeated. He would defeat them like that. And so this is what they're expecting. They're expecting this a physical king on a physical throne in a physical nation. Right? A lot of people still think that today. A lot of people still think, they think premillennialism. What's that? What's pre mean? Prior or before? What's millennial mean? A thousand? Before the thousand years? So before the thousand years, Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to reign for a thousand years on earth. And then he's going to take everybody that's with him back to heaven. Now, you, you read that in Revelation. You don't read that anywhere else. But, uh, and it's not what's going to happen. How do we know? I'd say a thousand years has already passed. Okay, a thousand years has already passed. What else has passed? The kingdom's already come. He's not going to set up his kingdom when he comes back. He's going to deliver the kingdom back to the Father. Right? Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Now, your friends and neighbors believe this. This is what they're taught. And I can tell you, I don't know what church they go to, but I do know that the majority of denominations believe this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 should set people straight. 
But it doesn't. It doesn't. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Are we there? So he says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. He delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. He's not going to set up a kingdom. When he comes again, he's going to deliver the kingdom to the Father. He's not going to set it up. It's already set up. But what's he talking about? He's talking about the church. He's not talking about, uh, you know, in Revelation it gives dimensions of, of, of what's supposedly heaven. It gives the dimensions of the walls and talks about the pearly gates and it talks about the golden streets. And we have been taught that that's talking about heaven and it's not. It's the same language Isaiah uses to describe the church to come. And it's the same language that's being used to describe the church that has come. And so, what we find here is that the church is the kingdom. Jesus said, I will build my church. And then he turns right to his apostles and he says, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Entrance into the church. I will give you the message. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. What's that mean? What does that mean? What, whatever you bind. Talking about the keys, the authority, right? Keys is a representation of authority. And he says, whatever you bind, whatever you teach that's binding, shall have already been bound in heaven. So in other words, you're going to be speaking the message that God gives you. God's already bound certain things. He's already loosed certain things. So it's not going to be new. So when you bind something and you say, this is what you must do, or this is what you must not do, it would have already been taught, already come forth from God. And all you're doing, Peter and the apostles, is just repeating what God says. So you just, you're going, you're teaching what God says. That's what that means. You know, we don't have the power, neither do the apostles, have the power to bind where God is not bound. Right? For instance, if I said, uh, uh, you will not go to heaven, uh, you will not go to heaven if you wear any color other than pink. And I can prove it. I'd be binding something where God is not taught. God never said that. Remember, Jesus said, he that believes in is baptized. He talks about repentance. He talks about confession. Right? He talks about those things. He said, here's, here's how you can be saved. He doesn't say anything about circumcision. Right? So what were some of the Jews doing? They were teaching circumcision. Teaching circumcision. And they would come. Uh, Paul establishes a church. He baptizes both Jews and Gentiles. So now these Jews over here, they have become Christians. We call them Jewish Christians. These Gentiles over here, they're no longer pagans, but they're Christians. They're Gentile Christians. So you have Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. They're just Christians now. And they're in this one body, the one church. And they have this one doctrine they've been taught. They said, this is what you need to learn, teach, and keep. This is the doctrine. But these Jews over here, they still hated the Gentiles over here. So that still was going on. And they hated them. They're dogs. Right? The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. So the Jews said, well, listen. I understand Jesus. He told us that we need to believe in him, believe his gospel, that we have to uh, repent of our sins, we have to confess him as our, as our Lord and Savior, and then be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. We've done all that, but God still chose us. And choosing us, he said we were to be circumcised, the group as a whole, not every person, because obviously females can't be circumcised. 
but the representation, if your family member was a male and you were circumcised, the whole entire family was now righteous. So circumcision was the way to be just before God. So they said, or they presumed to speak for God by saying, we think that since we are the chosen and we have circumcision and we're now made righteous in God's eyes, that all this other stuff, believing in Jesus, believing in the gospel, repenting of our sins, confession of Christ, and being baptized are all great things. But it's not better than having circumcision because that makes us righteous with God. And so they began to teach the Gentiles in the church that you better become circumcised to become like us, righteous before God. And this was causing a problem because some of the Gentiles were now believing them. Some were actually being circumcised. You know, picture it. You have a guy who's 50 years old. He's never been circumcised because pagans didn't circumcise. And now he's being told he's got to be circumcised. I know it would be hard for a lot of guys to become a Christian if they had to be circumcised at that moment. But that's what was going on. And they were believing this nonsense. But when you picture what Jesus told the apostles to teach, what did he tell them to teach? The very things that we just talked about. Here's what you're going to teach in the gospel. they got to believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God. they they got to believe in his gospel. They got to believe so much that they're going to repent of their sins and that confess him as Lord and that Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So we got to be baptized to be saved. He didn't say anything about circumcision. So these people were presuming to speak for Jesus. And they said, we got to add circumcision here. Now that's adding to God's word. That's twisting or perverting God's word. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people talk about Roman Catholicism. Remember, Reformation came out of Catholicism. And the reason it came out of Catholicism was because they were trying to reform the church. Not restore, but reform the church. And they reformed it because they said, we can't find in our Bibles anyone named Pope. We can't find a position like that in our Bibles, about anyone being a pope, being the vicar of Christ on earth. Can't read that. So we're not going to follow that. And that's wrong, because that's an addition to God's word. And we can't find where people worship Mary. So we're not going to follow that either. And so Martin Luther came, and he took 95 of those ideas, And he wrote them down, and then he went to the Catholic Church, and he put a a nail through the paper, and they called it the 95 Thesis, which was 95 reasons why we're leaving the Catholic Church. And he did, and they did, and they were considered heretics. But the reason they were doing it is because they realized that they had been adding to God's Word. So we can't add to God's Word. We can't take away from God's Word. We can't go beyond what is written. Notice... We'll close out here. Acts chapter 15. This is where there is a big meeting of the apostles and of the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And now look at verse, this is part of the letter that they wrote. Verse 24 of Acts 15. Since we have heard that some who went out from us, the Jews, have troubled you with words unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. If there's no commandment, why make it a a commandment? Why invent a commandment? And a lot of people do that today. They invent things They make them up so they can keep their people under control. And they say, if you don't follow us, you're going to hell. No. You go to hell because you don't follow God. (laughs) Right? That's the problem. All right.